Welcome to InfoHub Recap. We look back at the past week's main issues. In our headlines, the Green Expo wraps up. The head of state opens CAPM 2018. The Education Ministry awards top performers and Madias Guyana's 10th town. These stories and much more in this week's InfoHub Recap. First, we begin with the news that Tiffany Rodius reports that President Granger on Friday last urged Rupununi residents to develop entrepreneurial skills to add value to raw materials produced in Guyana. The head of state opened the second annual Regional Agricultural and Commercial Exhibition, or RACE, held at the Lethem Public Market. The president said RACE is an avenue through which the region can produce value-added products for public consumption. This will, over time, transform the economy. So when we speak about RACE, Re Regional Agricultural and Commercial Exhibition, you come to the understanding of why Guyana is poor because we have not been able to transform our economy. Nothing is wrong with producing bauxite. Nothing is wrong with producing timber. But after decades, we must be able to move production forward by adding value. So the rich countries are the ones which manufacture and process, and the poor countries are the ones which produce the raw materials. And as long as you continue simply producing raw materials for export, you remain poor. Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs Sidney Alicock noted race ensures food security across the country, especially as the effects of climate change become more pronounced. Today we are witnessing climate change. We are feeling it, we are seeing it. And race it is for us to be able to have food security, race is important. The brainchild of President Granger, race was introduced to promote agricultural development and to encourage citizens, including those in the hinterland, to better market their products. Since its inception, race has been expanding as farmers across the country have started to recognize the value of the initiative. For InfoHub, Tiffany Rogers. Patrons turned out in their numbers on Saturday last to get a final glimpse of the more than 120 exhibitors at the inaugural Green Guyana Expo hosted at the National Stadium. Tiffany tells us more. InfoHub spoke to some of the patrons about their expo experience. I've seen a lot of um, private persons actually coming out and doing their stuff, bringing out their, their, their goods to showcase and so on. A lot of boots you never used to see back in the past, you're now seeing coming out now. And a lot of new stuff coming out, so it's, it's very, it's very, very good. And I'm really impressed with the local folks, especially the young people. The products, I uh, met some people from East Frankfurt actually, and I, I was really impressed with the, the, the use of the local products that we have. This Green Expo was very fun, it was very enlightening. Lots of things that I learned, I learned I could go teach, in, teach my friends in school and so on. Like, uh, this Green Expo was really, really exciting. Huh? So I bought a couple of books uh, I, for, for reading and so I got a couple of plants to go and plant in my yard, huh? make it look good. The first of its kind, Green Guyana Expo began on October 18 and concluded with a grand concert on Saturday, October 20. The Green Guyana Expo and International Business Summit was held under the theme Sustainable Economic Growth Through Small Business Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Transformative Government Policies. For InfoHub, Tiffany Rogers. A major international conference got on the way here in Georgetown on Monday. The 2018 Biennial Conference of the Commonwealth Association for Public Administration and Management, CAPAM, was officially declared open by Prime Minister Moses Nakamutu, who was performing the duties of president. Here's that report. The acting president underscored the importance of partnerships and collaboration across borders in tackling climate change. The Cooperative Republic of Guyana is keen to collaborate with and learn from all innovative ideas at this historic juncture when we ourselves are engaged in reorienting and repositioning our public sector to embark on the path of a green state agenda as well as management of our environment as we develop a new oil and gas industry. The critical role of the public service in safeguarding the national patrimony was also highlighted. While CAPAM will invariably play its part in assisting with transformational change and international cooperation, a sustained local multi-stakeholder approach 
to any green agenda is necessary for its effective and efficient implementation. Seven, seven multi-stakeholder expert groups made up of public sector, private sector, and wider civil society members have been working with the Green State Development Strategy since its beginning in 2017. The conference is being held under the theme Transforming the Public Sector for Climate Governance. It brings together an international network of public service managers who will look for common ground in addressing the threats of climate change while ensuring sound economic growth. From the Marriott Hotel with videographer Akeem Thomas, Stacey Carmichael for InfoHub. Still on Kappa, President of the Association Tan Street, Dr. Ali Hamza, said the theme of this year's conference is timely given emerging global environmental challenges. With many regions experiencing both shared and unique climate challenges, it is clear that effective and efficient climate governance must occur across government systems through a multitude of sectors and industries in order to better tackle the complex environmental matters. Dr. Ali Hamza said at the same time the reality of ensuring strong economic growth for the nations and citizens remains all-consuming. How does the public sector manage this duality? Are there policies, strategies and approaches that account for both climate responsibility and economic prosperity? These are the questions that will be answered through our sub-teams and sub-group of experts and participants will discuss all these topics. The CAPAM president also urged that focus be placed on implementing the required legislation to adequately protect the environment. Meantime, Director of Governance and Peace Directorate, Commonwealth Secretariat, Catalina Sapolu, while echoing similar sentiments, called for the development of appropriate national strategies, such as the Green State Development Strategy, GSDS. The Commonwealth is supporting member states through the provision of technical assistance to facilitate the creation of adequate local capacity to address the threats posed by climate change. One important aspect of this assistance relates to access to climate finance as mandated by Commonwealth Heads of Government at the 2018 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that took place in London. Climate change has been identified as a major priority in the response to climate change. Plenary sessions are being hosted throughout the day. The conference concludes on Wednesday, October 24. For InfoHub, Stacey Carmichael. More firearm licenses were distributed to residents of Indigenous communities. More in this story. Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Sidney Alicock, visited Camarang over the weekend to make the distribution. And we are very pleased to be able to deliver on our promise, although it took some time, but I think good things come to those who wait. And today you have in your hands the good thing for your livelihood. Earlier this month, Minister Alicock and Ministers of Public Security, Kemraj Ramjatan, and Public Affairs, Don Hastings Williams, issued firearms and licenses to residents from 12 villages in Region 7. This weekend's distribution is a follow up to the earlier meeting, Minister Alicock noted. The last time they Minister of Minister Ramjatan and Deputy Commissioner Williams, they were here, they were able to resolve a number of issues. And we were able to bring some of those, uh, well, I think all. We got six that were out, outdated or uh, needed upgrading, those applications for purchase of firearm. Back in 2015, residents had turned in their unlicensed firearms during the Ministry of Public Security's amnesty program. The ministry's plans was to regularize the system, conduct safety checks, and allow for firearm holders, including Indigenous people, to be licensed. For InfoHub, Tiffany Rogers. On Tuesday, Guyana was commended for its vision of a green state development strategy. This is as the 12th biennial conference of the Commonwealth Association for Public Administration and Management, CAPAM, got underway. CAPAM's chief executive officer, Gay Hamilton, said with the discovery of oil and gas coupled with a largely untouched forest, Guyana has a unique opportunity to integrate economic growth and still be climate conscious. I think they would be well positioned to be an exemplar 
for many other countries in the world who maybe have already gone past that point and need to readjust. Over 200 delegates from Commonwealth nations are being engaged on the topic of climate change. Climate change is permeating every part of the fabric of our society and of our governments, and public servants need to be prepared for that transformation. Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of the Presidency's Department of Public Service, Reginald Brotherson, said Guyana has the necessary experience to lend support to CAPAM. From chain of experiences, cross-fertilization of ideas, countries um, within the Commonwealth sharing their own experiences of how they manage their, their country to public services. Guyana at least can borrow. We can learn um, new things, international best practice, to make in Guyana a better place in management and managing its environment. Under the theme, Transforming the Public Sector for Climate Governance, CAPAM will explore the topic of climate change and its many implications during the various plenary sessions. For InfoHub, Stacey Carmichael. The National Agriculture Research and Extension Institute on Monday launched its research conference under the theme, Agriculture, Guyana's Pathway to a Green Economy. Seneca Thorne was there and filed this report. The research conference focused on the Green State Development Strategy, Hinterland Agriculture, climate smart agriculture practices, improving production and productivity, green agriculture practices, and agriculture health and food safety issues. At the conference's opening at the Guyana School of Agriculture at Monrepo, Minister of Agriculture Noel Holder said, research plays an integral role in providing a sound base for the development and implementation of an agricultural policy. In particular, Research can provide a knowledge base for taking decisions and long-term planning that are needed to cope with the challenges. Research by 2030 and beyond will play a key role in improving the sustainability and diversity of our food systems. Finding solutions for food wastage, approximately 1.3 billion tons per acre per, per year annually, and reducing the global loss of biodiversity, which is nearly 60 percent. Minister Holder advised that Guyana's future research agenda must give priority to sustainable and inclusive economic development. This will target the challenges of food production, management of natural resources, and a balanced development of coastland and hinterland areas. Chairman of ANARI's Board of Directors, Dr. Patrick Chesney, reiterated its commitment to support research in all the 10 administrative regions. It is my intention as chairman of the NARI board to take to the NARI board a measure that would support the installation and wise use of cooperative and collaborative research infrastructure and programs in all of our administrative regions. Participants in the conference include farmers and representatives of farmers associations and other agriculture agencies. Sinico Thorne, InfoHub. Another major development has commenced in Georgetown. Renetta LaFleur tells us that a $21 billion Pegasus Suites and Corporate Center is underway. The work is being undertaken on owner Robert Badal's Kingston property, located next to the Pegasus Hotel. The upcoming high-rise building represents one of the largest investments of the local private sector in Guyana. To date, a fence has been erected on a portion of the northern parapet of Seawall Road in the interest of public safety and preliminary works are ongoing. Plans for the completed building include a 12-story hotel to provide luxury accommodation featuring bars, restaurants and entertainment facilities as well as long-term accommodation. A second tower, the hotel's corporate center, will be built alongside the Pegasus Suites. This new building is part of several other major developments happening around Georgetown, which will change the city's skyline. Renetta LaFleur for InfoHub. Duncan Street has a brand new look, having been recently resurfaced. Renetta joins us again. The $61 million project started on June 1, and all rehabilitation works were completed, except for the installation of two pedestrian crossings. Region 4 project engineer at the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, Ryan Amjad, said the project's scope of works includes the placement of asphalt concrete. The road is projected to last for at least 10 years without major repairs. The scope included milling the existing, existing asphaltic concrete, uh, adding about 5 inches crush run, 
to that and overlaying that with inch and a half asphaltic concrete. The estimated length between Vicentian Road and Sheriff Street is about 1058 meters and it's at 6.1 meters width. That's about 20 feet. Uh, between Sheriff Street and Eastern Highway, the length is about 733 meters length and about 5.49 meters width. Some auxiliary works included the cleaning of existing drains, installation of stop signs and pedestrian crossings, and painting of lane markings. Amjad urged motorists to use the newly upgraded road responsibly. The road before we had a lot of potholes, cracking, some a few amounts of alligator cracking. I would encourage persons to use the road carefully because the road is very smooth and it will encourage persons to speed more. So to use the road carefully, uh, obey the traffic signals that we installed. Pedestrians and motorists equally welcomed the upgrade. I must congratulate the government in doing this road. This road was, it needed to be done a long time. The road is good, it benefits a lot of people, but they need, they need to put speed on and look after the edge of the roads. The road was terrible, it, it's good now. Let me hope we stay with the maintenance. The works were executed by S. Jagmohan Hardware Supplies Construction Services. Similar works are expected on several other streets in and around Georgetown in 2019. Renata LaFleur for InfoHub. East Bank traffic woes could soon be a thing of the past. The East Bank East Coast Road link is closer to becoming reality with an agreement with the Government of India for the commencement of works. Here are the details. The road design will allow for a new alignment approximately 15 km long connecting the East Coast to the East Bank of Demerara. Minister of Public Infrastructure David Patterson said the completion of the feasibility study is a major accomplishment for his ministry. Feasibility report has been um, submitted. We have um, examined it. We had some comments. There are a few comments, but I'm glad to say, all in all, I think it, it's um, it's it, it has satisfied our needs. Um, so that is going to be launched, um, and so that was a major accomplishment. So having the designs for that road um, completed. The project has three distinctive stages. Stage one is a detailed project report preparation, stage two, construction supervision, and stage three, post-construction defects liability period. Minister Patterson. So we now want the next stage from the feasibility into the procurement, and that's scheduled to, to go to procurement by um, April next year to commence um, work mid next year. The new road will reduce congestion by providing commuters with an alternative route in and out of Georgetown, improving safety and comfort. Renetta LaFleur for InfoHub. The National Commission on Disability has moved to sensitize media personnel on how to effectively communicate issues involving persons with disabilities with the hosting of a summit. Delicia Haynes brings us the details. On October 27, 2018, a one-day media summit will be hosted at the Herdvanston Lodge from 9.30 to 13.30 hours. Knowledge shared at this event is expected to equip journalists with the relevant information needed for reports and stories that address persons with disabilities. Also, this session will prepare journalists with the necessary foreknowledge for accurate and sensitive reporting. The objective of the summit intends to make media operatives aware of basic disability etiquette. As we know, oftentimes we would see in the newspapers that journalists would describe persons with disabilities as, for example, wheelchair bound. No one is basically bound to a wheelchair. They're just using the wheelchair as a means of mobility. Corica said, some of the desired outcomes include ensuring media personnel are aware of the responsibilities of reporting as outlined in the Persons with Disabilities Act of 2010. The media summit is geared to ensure that media operatives be aware of their responsibilities with regards to the Guyana Persons with Disability Act, in particular subpart Eight, that speaks about communication and what the media is required when, com when it comes to communicating with persons with disabilities. Personnel from all media platforms, including print, television and radio mediums, are invited to participate in this event. The National Commission on Disability collaborated with the Guyana Press Association to make this event possible. 
Minister of Public Health Valdo Lawrence and Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu are expected to attend this event, while international representatives with disabilities will be addressing the gathering. For Info Hub, Delicia Haynes. On Thursday, top cop Leslie James said the Guyana Police Force and the Joint Services are ready to cast their ballot on November 2 for LGE. The commissioner also announced that the force is expanding its crime fighting capacity. Paul McAdam has all the details. The Guyana Police Force is doing its part to ensure the smooth running of the November 12th local government elections, according to Police Commissioner Leslie James. A few days ago, the ballots, ballot papers that is, arrived in the country and they were escorted to from the Chedi Jagan International Airport to GCOM headquarters where it was fully handed over. And those ballots are under constant security. As you know, we have an impending uh, local government elections. The military or joint services, they will be voting on the second. Addressing the media on October 25, Commissioner James also spoke of ongoing efforts to reform and modernize the force. You'll see a better response time. And of course, our divisions will be better patrol. That is mobile patrol, foot patrol, mobile in terms of four-wheel and two-wheel type vehicles. He said that moves are also being made to resuscitate the force's aviation and maritime wings. If this country is a, a serious investment destination, it means we have to engage in best practices, which includes aviation capability. The commission is also reinforcing the force's anti-corruption stance. Corruption is a decision made by individuals. It's not for the want of training ranks would get involved with corruption. It's a decision. And I, I want to make it clear. Let me take the opportunity. I want to make a call to our citizens. Without an offer, they can't be an acceptance. Mm -hmm. I would urge persons who do not have the documents in place, have your documents fully in force. If you do not have a permit to carry a tint, ensure you get the requisite permit, among other things. Drive or use the road safely. So you would not have any reason to be stopped by a policeman, which, and then the, the rest, the, the, the solid type of reports will be occasioned. Commissioner James's press conference comes 56 days after his appointment and several divisional visits. Paul McCann for InfoHub. Madia joined Bartica in Region 1, Lethem in Region 9, and Mabarume in Region 1 as the most recent communities to be granted township status. Renette Lafleur traveled to the community to witness the event and brings us that report. President Granger described the event as one of the most powerful economic reformers in Madia's history. We have embarked today, the 25th of October, on one of the most powerful economic changes in history of Madia. First of all, you are installing and embedding democracy in this town. Democratization will ensure that every citizen will have the opportunity to be involved in decision making. Madi is now the capital town of the Patara Siparuni region. Minister of Communities Ronald Bulkan noted that the government's vision is to establish a capital town in each of the country's administrative regions. The coalition administration is unapologetic about its pursuit of resuscitating the system of local government because of our deep belief in the appropriateness of such a model given the divided nature of our society and that it furthers democratic governance and that it represents the best formula to realize better managed communities. At the end of the historic event, the Madia Monument was unveiled. Madia's earliest recorded settlement is in the 1884. In the 1930s, with the construction of the Denham Suspension Bridge and improved road access to the area, Madia grew to an area of prominence. Renette Lafleur for our Info Hub. Madia's $827 million internal road network was also commissioned. Here is more from Renetta. The $827 million internal road network was officially commissioned by Minister of Public Infrastructure David Patterson. He hailed the milestone as another step in increasing the connectivity between the coast and the hinterland region. Residents and road users should therefore 
would have therefore noticed the rehabilitation of several bridges, the installation of a, road, a, a reinforced concrete ridge of pavement with corps, a network of reinforced concrete drains and culvert, complemented by road safety elements, inclusive of road markings and signage. 80% of the roads were upgraded from laterite to concrete structures built to last for decades. Speed bumps and 15 solar street lights will soon be installed. Minister Patterson said greater developments are slated for the region in 2019. A sum of $105 million was al allocated for the rehabilitation of the road from Karasabai to Paramakatoy. Rehabilitation of the road from Hullfoot, Hullfoot, Hillfoot, straight to the airport in the first phase and then onwards to the new housing scheme in the second phase, which I understand is the proposed new location for the new hospital. Renetta LaFleur for InfoHub. The multi-billion dollar Guyana and China loan agreement for national broadband network was inked. Paul has the details. The almost 8 billion or 37.6 million US dollar concessional loan agreement with the Chinese government via the Exim Bank will finally correct previous attempts made by the last administration. According to the finance minister, it will be a catalyst for efficiency, productivity and profitability from an economic standpoint. Today's signing is a testimony to this government's commitment to make a reality of what others bungled. This project represents the first phase of national broadband connectivity, of which four ICT content will be involved, as I said, e-health, e-education, e-security, and e-government. In other phases, rollout will be done to the wider public services and across the 10 administrative regions. It also envisages an alternative subterranean cable connectivity to improve broadband services for the public and private sectors in furtherance of the liberalization of the sector. The capacity and ICT connectivity of the health, education, security sectors, and government agencies will be boosted, Minister of Public Telecommunications Catherine Hughes noted. As you know, computerized systems allows us to protect data, to protect information in ministries, in agencies, and of course, most importantly, to ensure through cybersecurity mechanisms that we keep our data and information safe. So I am excited that, in fact, I was saying to Ambassador that next year this time, I think we would already begin to see some of the deliverables under this project. The transparency of the unique agreement was noted by the Chinese ambassador, who described it as another highlight of the two countries' relationship and a good opportunity. Our predecessors have set a solid foundation, the bedrock for the relationship. This is one of the main reasons that Chinese side would like to provide the concessional loans. Mm -hmm. So I think that the Guyanese side, whatever the business level and the government level, that we could work together to benefit the people of Guyana. The loan is repayable over 20 years with a five-year grace period and a 2% interest rate. The National Broadband Project should be completed by mid-2020. Paul McAdam for InfoHub. Two Luzignan prison escapees are still being hunted by the Joint Services. Paul Goraya and Cabena Stevens are on the run. Report any information you may have to 2204173 or the nearest police station. You have been watching InfoHub Recap, where we share the past week's top stories. Goodbye now.